but uh, chapter 3, I always bring extra notes. Uh, I know that we've been on this chapter for quite some time, but there's been a lot of information there, hasn't there? We've learned quite a bit. So, I do have another handout that will go with chapter 3 if we can get to that point. I don't know that you have the diagram, but I have it up here and I'll hand that out in a little bit. We're on Roman numeral uh, 3. And we're not going back, we're going forward. Roman numeral 3, letter E. Roman numeral 3, letter E. Just a little review. Uh, does anybody remember uh, which church, which letter are we on? Laodicea. Now how is it worded in Revelations? Church of the Laodiceans. Remember? Because that was the only church that the Lord didn't say the church at or of. He said it was uh, not of or in. He said this was a church of the Laodiceans, meaning that they were worldly. Okay, This is the last letter, okay? The last letter to the last church. Now, what's interesting, as we look at this, as we've done, we've done our studies here so far, uh, uh, the Lord's dealt with a vertical relationship in chapter number 1, and now he's dealing with the church's relationship in chapter 2 and 3. Now, why is he dealing with the church's relationship before he goes into chapter 4? Because he wants to make sure the church understands what we need to make sure that we're right with the Lord before he tells us about what? What's more important than the rapture and the, and the end times? Being right. Being right with God. That's right. And uh, you know what? One thing that the church, a lot of, I remember a time where pastors would post that they're going to do a study in Revelations, and people would pack the church out. How remembers that? They pack it out. You know what? Not anymore. Not anymore. Right. Amen. Yeah, it's a shame, isn't it? Not anymore. Well, I'll tell you why. The church has not been right with God. That's why. <laughs> Amen. And so we can't understand Revelation. So a lot of people that have been taught Daniel or Revelations don't understand it because you first have to have a relationship with God, not just to understand it, but you, you've got to really dig deep to be able to teach it. Amen. You say, yeah, thanks, Lord. Thanks. I wasn't looking forward to Daniel. Amen. <laughs> remember, Corinne? Oh, my word, that's going to be a tough one to teach. I remember doing that in Bible college. That's tough. That's a tough book, isn't it? It's not really, is it? We learned it wasn't too tough, didn't we? Pretty simple. So, But anyways, we're in Revelation chapter 3, and we're understanding that there are these seven, seven types of churches with uh, all these different issues. And one of the things that we learned about the church at Laodicea is they were rich. Remember, it was a rich town. They didn't have need of anything. Uh, uh, the other thing we've learned here, let's just, I'm just trying to remember, there was nothing good that he could see of the church, which is rare, right? It is rare because they're the only church that he didn't say that there was something they did good. <laughs> right, right, amen. And so we go to E, which is chastisement. Now, let's go ahead and read verse 19 in Revelation chapter 3, since that's where we're at. And then I want to discuss what that word means. The Bible says, are you there in Revelation 3, 19? It says, as many as I love, I what? I rebuke and chasten. Now notice what it says next. It says, be zealous, therefore, and repent. So notice here, what, what does uh, the word chastisement mean to you? Now I'm going to stop on that because uh, it's important to understand that with this church because they're the ones, they need more chastisement than others do. But what is chastisement? Does anybody know? Just give me a, I know you know. Yes, correction. Making fun of? No. <laughs> chastisement remember what the Lord says to us we're going to go over that and we're going to open our Bible up and look at that in a minute uh, what does God do to the world his wrath what does he do to his own the Bible says chastise what's the difference between, uh, between wrath and chastise love love Okay, so here's something you got to remember. When the Lord is dealing with someone who's lost, they don't get love. Remember, uh, the only way you get the love of Christ or the love of God is through the blood of Jesus. Okay, now you can't be, uh, uh, you don't get chastisement if you're lost. You get, you get judged by God, don't you? And there, the judgment of God is pretty cruel when it comes to sin, doesn't it? 
because Jesus had to pay for it. And now if you don't accept the paid gift of the blood, just like the Passover, then what happened? If you didn't put the blood over your door, even if you were Israel during the Passover, what would happen to your oldest child? Why? Wait a minute, we're in Israel. Because the blood is the only thing that stopped the death angel from killing your child. You get, are you with me? So what is the only thing that's stopping us from having the wrath of God? The blood, okay, now I want to get a little deeper, okay, I like that, don't you? All right, so there's some pictures of that in the Old Testament, all right, not just the Passover. Where's another picture? Noah's Ark is a picture of the blood of Christ. You say, how so? Well, if you look at how they did the, they built the ark, it had pitch from within and pitch from without. That's a picture of the Holy Spirit of God sealing them. Uh, and guess what? They didn't even get to see the wrath of God. Are we going to get to see the wrath of God? No. no, there was no windows. They were now. Who shut the ark's door? God did. How about this? Remember Moses? How was? Remember he was supposed to be killed. Remember? Okay, where was he placed in? An ark. The Bible calls it an ark. Did you know it was made the exact same way as Noah's ark? Did you know that? It had pitch from within and pitch from without. Whew, boy, that's deep, isn't it? Another picture of the blood of Christ. Huh. How did he get saved from being killed? You know what's funny? The ones who wanted to kill him, what did they do? They raised him. Took him as their own. Wonder why? Because he had the blood of Christ on him. Did he not? Amen. He sure did. Praise God. Anyway, so chastisement, the only way you can be chastised of the Lord is, is if you are a child of God or pictured of the church. The ch now, here's something else I want to discuss. And I've heard this said, and I've never heard this before in my life, but I heard someone say just a few days ago that, that they were the church. Now, is that right? Are you the church? Well, we are, but collectively. You're, you're not the church by yourself. Okay, The Bible says you're a temple of God. Now, that's singular. Of course, the Holy Spirit comes and resides in all of us when you get saved. But it doesn't mean you're the church because the Bible says church, which is ecclesia, go look it up, means an assembly. Now, the only way to be a part of the church is to be a part of the assembly. Now, the Bible makes it clear how to be a part of the assembly. You have to be saved and baptized. Right, don't you? Amen. And the only way to be in an assembly is to be there what? Physically. Can you be part of a crowd if you're not in it? Are you a part of the crowd if you watch it on TV? You're not a part of the assembly at that point. Okay? And so we got to remember, uh, just because you go out, you're not the church. I heard someone say that, hey, I'm the church, I'm going to take the, I'm going to take, I'm going to go with the church where the church won't go. Well, number one, shame on you. Because if the church can't go there, then neither should you. Amen. There you go. Right? You can't heal lepers. So I'm just being honest. So you better not go get leprosy on you. Amen. <laughs> now, I know that God still heals, right? Amen. Can he heal? Oh, amen. Can he, can he raise from the dead? He still does. But you know what? Let me help you. Do you know even the apostles who had the power of healing couldn't even heal unless God wanted them to? Yep. Let me ask you this. So can I pray over you and ask God to heal you? I can. Does it mean he'll do it? No. Do you know that Paul prayed three times and God said, no, my grace is sufficient. Wait a minute. Paul could heal others only when God allowed him. Let me ask you this. Does his power more? than ours? No. Absolutely not. The only reason I got on this is because I, that word church hit me. And I want you to understand, we're collectively a part of the church, and we're supposed to assemble as the church. That's what makes a church a church. But when you leave this place, you still represent the church, but you're a temple of God. You have the Holy Spirit of God within you. Now where you go, you're taking Him with you. Remember that. So, chastisement is for uh, the saints. And here's another word that's been taken out of, Christianity has been taken out of. So, what is a saint? How do you become a saint? How do you, you ask Jesus in your heart, right? Did you know once you ask Jesus in your heart, you're a saint? 
wait a minute, so I don't have to die first? And there isn't a committee that makes me, that's silly. That would be like saying, uh, once you die, Miss Deborah, we're all going to get together and we're going to pray and ask God to save you. Well, if you weren't saved before you died, then you can't be saved. Amen. Because the word saint means you were born again. You're a child of God. The Bible talks about saints. Okay, The Old Testament saints were those who follow God. Amen. Uh, you can't be a saint after death. Just trying to help you, okay? There's some words that... And the reason why we're talking about this is because of the fact that chastisement has to do with the child of God and the church. And now think about this for just a minute. That word chastisement means a loving discipline. It means a loving correction. Now, I don't know about you, I don't remember my dad giving me <laughs> too loving a discipline sometimes, do you? But our Heavenly Father is not your dad. Now, I know in all reality, our fathers are supposed to resemble God the Father. Did you know that? But they didn't do a good job because a lot of us have a, a, a misunderstanding of who God is because we looked at our dad to get what God represents. And I'm sorry, but that's not who God was. And my dad isn't like the father. Now, remember the Bible says this, and I don't know why I'm, I'm on this word thing, but I know the first thing I think of when I say father, I go to that verse in Scripture where the Bible says, Jesus said himself, no man be called father but the father above. Who remembers that? Okay, there's some churches that call themselves fathers, don't they? Do you know the difference between me being called a father, like for my kids, or grandfather? That's not the same father. Remember, we learned that. The word father Jesus is talking about is the originator. The creator. And actually, if you go back to the Oxford Dictionary, the Old English, and only in that one part where, God, where Jesus says that, that's what that word means. It doesn't mean father like me. So I can be called father in that respect, but we're not to be called the father like some churches ask you to call them father. Well, I'm telling you what, I'm waiting for lightning to strike. They're not the creator or originators. God is the only originator and creator, amen? So anyways, uh, this, this, this all kind of does go together. So chastisement is correction or loving punishment. Now, look at that verse in verse number 19, if you would. And it says, as many as I what? I love. <laughs> now, now let, me, let me ask you this. Now, think about this for just a minute. We know he's talking to the church, okay? God loves the whole world, does he not? But his love for us is different than his love for a sinner who won't choose him. They won't take the payment for sin, so they have to pay for sin themselves. That's a big payment, isn't it? That they'll not want to pay for once they realize, right, amen. But he says, as many as I love, I do what? I rebuke and chasten. Now notice it says, be zealous therefore and repent. Now, I, I wrote this down right here besides chastisement, and I haven't went any further than E, so I, I hope you're not getting lost. Uh, but be zealous there. What he's saying there in that verse, now remember, he's given them some loving discipline right here, right? Like a loving father. He is. Think about that. Think about the last time your dad sat down with you and said, now, I'm just telling you this for your own good, right? And I, I know that, hey, wait a minute, I know you're my son, and I know that I'm your father. That's basically what he's saying. And I love you. Listen to me. Be zealous there means you need to start having a desire for, you need to start being engaged in, are you following me? You need to move. With me? See, what happened to this church is they felt that their movement to the mall was enough. But that's not the movement that God wants. The desire that God wants is for the word of God. Now, you know how uh, you, uh, Miss Jan says you can always tell someone that loves the Lord because it's like your best friends right off the bat if you love them. Amen. I just fell in love with James Hinkle a long time ago because I, every time he, I went to a lot of nursing homes with them. I even went to South Carolina to a, 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 a couple week uh, tent revival and they sang the same song. I mean, it's not that they didn't have other songs. They just were, they were led to sing that one song. And every time he sang it, it was like it was the first time he ever sang it. And he had tears coming down his eyes. And I was like, wow, he loves the Lord. 
because it was new every time he sang it. The problem isn't the song, are you with me? The problem isn't that the Bible's old. The Bible, it, wait a minute. It's that you have a problem. God never changed. He still is most, the most loving, most powerful God. It's that you've changed. You've moved residencies. Now notice here, he's saying with love, I want you to be zealous. You need to move. Now wait a minute, I'm gonna, I want you to understand. Here's a picture of God, even Jesus, the prodigal son. Now, Jesus gave you everything, did he not? He even let you go do what you want, did he not? But I want you to understand one thing. He never left. You did. Same with this church. Christ never left. The church did. What they did was they moved far enough away where God could be outside the door. Are you with me? Just far enough away where they know he's still there, yet they don't have to do what he says. Are you with me? Now, I want you to understand something. Even while he was in the pig pen, go read. Jesus didn't go to him, did he? Did he send his servants after him? Did he still love him? He was worried about him, wasn't he? He was looking for him. He was waiting for him. But let me help you with something. Jesus never moved. They had to because he's not the one who left. Are you with me? You say, what does that have to do with this verse right here? Because zealous means to move. Jesus says, come. Or he calls. He's calling you to him. He's not going to you. He's where he always has been. You've departed. Are you with me? That's good, isn't it? We like to take him. We like to think we're taking him wherever we go, but uh, that's not the truth. Amen. We go to the hog pen. Jesus waits for us to come to ourselves because if you go to read that, that uh, passage of scripture, it says that he was in the hog pen eating the hog's food, and it says that he came to himself. You know what he did? He knew he was wrong, and he had to go back home. He had to move. He had to have his desire changed, didn't it? <laughs> uh, he was engaged, and he moved. Now, the Bible also says, what's the next two words? It says, be zealous and what? Uh, boy, now if you put those two phrases together, to engage and repent, to move and repent. Well, that's a picture of the altar there. A lot of us don't want to go to the altar. A lot of us don't want to go to church. Well, pastor, what are you preaching? Because depending on what you're preaching depends on whether I want to go or not. If you'll preach on the love of God, I'll be there. But if you're going to preach on anything that's going to hurt my feelings, I don't want to go because I don't want to feel convicted. Right? You know, the Lord has to get us to that place so that we'll break, so that we'll come, fix our desire, move to the altar, and repent. Do you know the picture of the prodigal son coming home is a picture of him coming to get right with the Lord. It's a picture of the altar call, friend. He got right. He recognized he was wrong in the pen. Now look underneath here, underneath E there. It says, here we see the only smile in the letter. Now notice, the Lord's sick over this church. He is. He's literally left outside the assembly, but he still reminds them of what? Aren't you glad? I'm sure, man, I'm, I don't ever understood that. I remember what I did. You don't need to think about what I did. You remember what you did and still loved me and still wanted me and still called me. And see, the Lord's not counted this church out even though he's not in it. Now, here's a good application that I put in your notes. Parents may be deeply hurt, and, and you know what? I can relate. Parents can be deeply hurt and estranged through the actions of their children. Now listen. But even when correcting them, they need to assure them of what? Now notice, I want you to understand something. Sometimes we want to have our children be children forever. But our children are not children forever. And when they become adults, do you know that adulthood in the Bible was 30? How many knows that? 
Jesus didn't start his ministry till 30. So, yeah, his child till 30. But he, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no kidding. When it's your daughter, yeah, sweet. <laughs> yeah, right. You heard, Pastor? Yeah, right. Yeah, but you got to work. Yeah, amen. <laughs> Uh, but anyways, I'm just saying, uh, but think about this. Now, there, there's a lot of misconception uh, today about all that stuff, and I'm not going to get into all that. That would be a good uh, family uh, lesson. But uh, uh, remember, uh, children uh, need to be assured of, of genuine love. Now, I think that's really, really important at a young age, and it needs to be built up all the way through uh, teens. And a lot of reason why teens rebel is because of the fact that their parents haven't really shown them that genuine love and concern and communication at a young age. And now, of course, that I'm older and I, I got high insight and that how it works now I know how to do it I'm going to do it right with my grandkids are you paying attention uh, but I, I'm just saying most of the time our kids get rebellious because we made them that way yeah ouch I'm busy go to the playroom did you even hear what they said now I try to listen. One thing I learned, it took 50 years. Huh? <laughs> now I try to listen to the little, kid, little ones, you know, don't I? Like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Oh, you got a sticker in your sock? Oh, go to your room, go play, right? Aren't you glad the Father does that for you? That's what he's doing here, right? He's listened, he's seen what they're going through. Here we are, look it down at your notes. The Lord still loves this church, but finds it necessary to reprove. Now, the word reprove means to charge with a fault. Something that we don't like, is it? Now, open your Bibles. This is important for us to see Proverbs chapter 3. T turn your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 3. One thing I think that none of us like, amen, my wife, she likes to tell me where I do things wrong. Amen. I like to get her while I'm up here because she can't get me till we get in a truck on the way home. Amen. Uh, but Proverbs chapter 3, look at this with me, verse 11 to 12. Notice what it says here, and this is important. I wish every one of the church was here. Uh, this is very important. Verse 11 and 12, what does it say? My son do what? Well, the next two words, are you there? Proverbs 3, verse 11. It says, despise what? Despise not. Uh-oh, are you listening? It says, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For my son, uh, for whom the Lord loveth, he what? Correcteth, even as a father of the son in whom he delighteth. We're not supposed to despise the chastening of the Lord. Now, I'm sorry if every time you come to church you feel like the Lord's chastening you, uh, but I, I'm going to be honest with you. It's because of the fact that we haven't been in the Bible and we haven't had a really good relationship with him for him to correct us during the week. Amen. We wouldn't feel so chastened when we hear the word of God if we'd be in the word of God. Are you with me? Look over at Hebrews chapter 12. You know, the Lord would uh, correct you all through the week because there's not one of us that don't have problems. Hebrews chapter 12. The only reason I can turn there fast is because I've been flipping my Bible for so many years. But you know what? Sometimes when I get up here, I'll have a, a brain blank. None of y'all have ever had that, right? No. I'll have a brain blank, and I can't even remember where it is, and it'll be an obvious book. Isn't that crazy? I'm like, all right, Lord, I guess you don't want me to go there, <laughs> right? Hebrews chapter 12, that story was to help you give you more time to get there. Hebrews 12, look at 5 and 6 with me. Hebrews 12, verse 5 and 6, Corinda's only one there. It says, and have you, uh, let me make sure I'm in the right place, yeah, verse 5 and 6, and have you forgotten the exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto what? Children, now notice, here it is again. My son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Look at verse 6. For whom the Lord does what? Loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he receiveth. No, I didn't look up the word scourgeth. I've looked at it, looked it up before, but that would be a little bit more of a stern. Uh, I'd rather be chastened. I don't like waiting to get scourged. And you say, preacher, have you ever been scourged? Yes. It's not, I'd rather just stick with chastening. Don't let it get to that. And don't let it get past that. He'll call you home and he'll talk to you directly. Amen. Note that this, this correction and chastening of the Lord is not to punish. Are you listening? Huh? 
This is something that we as parents were good at. Have you learned your lesson yet? You're going to your room because you're getting punished, right? No, this, this, this chastening of the Lord is not to punish but to lead the church to what? Dependence. You know, I'm going to help you, uh, parents. If you'll follow the way the Lord chastens and works in your life, it'll work with your children. The ultimate goal of discipline is not to punish. What is repentance? 1 John 1 9. It's confession. It's admittance. You know, you want to get your kids to a point, and the only way to do it is through ch chastening, a loving discipline. The only way you can get a child to say, Dad, you're right, I was wrong, and now I understand. See what happened is they've repented. That's what we're seeking. That's what the Lord's seeking. The Lord's not seeking a rebel. If we're going to drive it with anger, you're going to end up with a rebel. Notice he's dealing with the rebel. Right? Notice how he deals with the rebel. Now, it's not that he's not stern. And he's going to give them a consequence if they don't follow his instruction. Is he not? There should be. Amen. All right, now let's turn the page. All right. Uh, all right, now next, F. Where are we at? What time? Oh, I got eight minutes. Man, we need like three hours. This is, a, this is a college class. We're really supposed to have like three and a half, I think. All right, so what's challenge there? What is the word challenge? Well, let's read verse 20 and 22. I want to get into it a little bit. Uh, the Bible says in verse 20 of Revelation 3, and then we'll jump down to 22. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and uh, open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. And verse 22 says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit hath saith unto the churches. Well, of course, if you let him in and sup with him, you're going to be able to hear him. Am I right? Okay, so here's where we're going. We went from chastisement. Now, notice, once he gives them a, a chastisement, okay, he's going to give them what? A challenge. Now, what's a challenge? Now, I'm going to give you an idea of a challenge. Who plays sports? I've played sports. i played soccer. Can you believe I played soccer in Wyoming, the coldest place in the world to play soccer in? Still played in shorts and a T-shirt. Can you believe that? 30 below. I know I was nut. But uh, anyways, uh, there's a challenge, isn't there? And the challenge that our coach gave us is that we needed to win as a team. Now, the way that we win, I was a sweeper. I don't know if you know what a sweeper was, but they, they stood in front of the two forwards right in the back, and we could follow the ball all over the field. Okay, you got a left wing, a right wing, you got a center. But anyways, uh, uh, the challenge was for me not to go take the left wing's job. I didn't decide that I'm not the sweeper, so I'm going to be the goalie because the goalie ain't doing his job. No, my job was to work as a team. The challenge was is if we worked as a team and communicated, are you with me? It's kind of like a church, isn't it? If we worked as a team and all used, and guess what? The coach got to pick where we went. We didn't. I didn't go, Coach, hey, by the way, I like the sweeper position because I like running all over the field. <laughs> I'd rather be the guys in the back. They didn't go too far, right? No, the coach says, hey, that'd be the Lord, wouldn't it? Because remember, he's the chief. The Lord says, hey, I want you right here because I think that you're going to be good there, right? And they worked as a team. And you know what the challenge was? Something to fight for. We were fighting to win, we're in a fight. Are you filling your position? They weren't. Are you with me? Dysfunctionate church. Just as bad as a dysfunctionate soccer game. Now, if you want to see what a dysfunctionate soccer game is, go to a three-year-old soccer game, and the kids don't even know where to run or what to do with the ball. Kids are going everywhere. Some are crying. Some are pulling weeds, right? Have you ever seen them? My son, I was like, I've never put him in sports again. He sat out and played with the dirt. Get up! Right? <laughs> the ball's coming! He's like, hey, Dad. Ball goes right by him. He don't care. Right? Dysfunction it. We're not playing our role. The Lord says, hey, I've got a challenge. Will you listen? 
Well, this breaks my heart. I've got a challenge. I'm right outside your heart's door, child of God. And there are some rooms that you haven't let me in. And you can't play as a team member because you won't even let me in those rooms. I'm the coach. You're not. There's some things that you're fighting for that you shouldn't be fighting for. Why don't you let me do it? The only hope for a lukewarm church is to invite or allow Christ to take up his rightful place. I hate doing this, but we're fixing to have to stop here. But look at Revelations 3 and verse 20 again. It says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice. Now notice, he's not talking to lost people. This is a letter to the who? Church. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I'll come into him. Now this is special, and I will sup with him and him with me. And then the next thing is, is that you'll hear. I don't know about you, I can't wait to sup with him, but he wants to sup with you now. The reason why you haven't done it, you say, what is all that about? That's, you know what the intimate thing with Jesus was when he was sitting around the, the table of the Lord's Supper with the twelve in the upper room? They said they were supping before. What were they doing? They were sticking their biscuits in the, I don't know what they were sticking them in, something and dunking them in and eating and having personal conversation with the Lord, weren't they? And Jesus was talking to him about what was fixing to happen, wasn't he? Right. He was talking about Peter. He talked about Judas selling him off at 30. It was intimate. And it was so intimate that the disciples at that point there in the upper room, they opened up, did they not? You want to know how I know they opened up and they were, they were having a real time like here, what Jesus wants? You want to know how I know? Because when we're not having a real relationship with the Lord, the first thing we do is, oh, no, that was Eldon. That's Eldon. No, that's not what they said. When Jesus said that, the, that someone was going to do this and someone's going to do that, they were like, is it I, Lord? You know, the one who did it knew. He already had sold him, right? Yeah, he knew. But he didn't say, is it I, Lord? <laughs> he's, he's probably going, I'm waiting for someone to point a finger at me, right? Isn't that how you feel when you're not right with God? Someone's pointing at me. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> so the only way to allow yourself to get out of that lukewarmness is to invite the Lord in. Isn't that awesome? I think that's a great picture of love because you've got to allow him to come in. Now, I've got just two minutes. Amen. I want you to look at the very first one. I'm going to mark it right here. The very first one. Notice he says, behold I, in verse number 20. Behold I. Notice what that is. That is your blank there is petitioner. Petitioner. Now, what is a petitioner? Does anybody know? What is a petition? Yeah, yeah, pretty much. You know what's interesting? God's not commanding them like we like to do. Guess what he's saying outside that door? You know what he's saying? Behold, I notice he's saying the petitioner is one that presents. This is the offer. You know, he gave us an offer when we were lost. He says, you either are going to die and go to a place called hell, or you're going to die and go to a place, heaven. And I'm petitioning this to you. Remember when the Father drew you? I, I can't forget. That was pretty powerful. <laughs> My, I, could, I remember leaving church several times and saying, man, I don't ever want to go to church again. I hate that feeling. All, he wasn't doing anything but petitioning to me and saying, I don't want you to die, die and go to hell. Okay, uh, I'm telling. I'm presenting you with something. Funny thing is, is when the Lord presents something to us, we won't listen. Now, I I, I keep relating it to me and my wife. That's a good one. <laughs> Sometimes she wants to present something to me, and I've already I already figured in my head, Tommy, that I know what she's going to present. I'm nope. We ain't doing that. Huh? Is that what we do to the Lord? Wait a minute. You better listen to him because the consequence won't be that great. 
So he came to them as a petitioner, one that presents, one that requests, and it's formal. Now, you know what I found out when I looked up this word in the first Webster's Dictionary? That it, it, it's not just formal, but it's a verbal and written petition. You know why that's neat? That means that those who heard before the scriptures, it was verbal. But we have the scriptures which are both verbal and written. Isn't that awesome? You say, well, I preacher, I don't even know what he's trying to petition me to do. You just answered your question, didn't you? <laughs> Let me tell you something. This is something I've had to share with a lot of people, and my pastor had to share it with me. I, I'd get to the point in my life where I was so frustrated. I said, I, I just wish God would come and grab me by the hand and tell me right to my face what I need to do. He said, why? You won't read it. Mm -hmm. He would never say anything outside of God's word. Did you know that? Do you know why Jesus won't come down and tell you again? Because he's already wrote everything. The Bible says, I've given you all things pertaining to life and godliness. It's in the scriptures. He says, there isn't anything that I'm going to say to you outside of God's word. It's all there. All things pertaining to life and godliness. It's all right here, friend. You say, well, preacher, I just haven't got to that part then. Maybe you haven't got to that part in your spiritual life. Huh? Maybe we need to develop. But let's go ahead and stand. We'll close in a word of prayer. Amen. Isn't that great? Isn't that amazing? The Lord's amazing. Amen. He shows us some amazing things. You know what's interesting is as he shows us how he reacts to the church, he also shows us how we're to react to our children, how we're to react to our spouses. Isn't that amazing? It's deep, isn't it? All right. Let's close in a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, God, Lord.